Thank you so much. Take the word of God and go with me to Luke 18 this morning. Luke chapter 18. I love that song. It's beautiful, isn't it? And I'm glad I've been covered by the blood. That's a comforting thought. Comforting thought. Interesting to speak of the blood that way, but it's a comforting thought. Know that my sins have been forgiven and washed away. Thank the Lord for it. Luke chapter 18, and there are several parables there given by our Lord. And we're going to begin our reading in verse number 9 this morning and look at verses 9 through 14. I believe the Lord has led us to that for this time, and I appreciate your prayers for me. I want to do my best when it comes time to give God's word and preach God's word. But my best means very little without God's touch. <laughs> my best means nothing, really. We need the touch of God, don't we? And, uh, but at the same time, we're, we learned this morning in our Bible study time that we're co-laborers with God. I have to remember that. Even when I stand and sing, stand and preach, when we take, do what we do for the Lord, we're laboring together with God. I'm glad I'm in the yoke with Jesus. How about that? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you. That doesn't sound like a wonderful invitation, does it? That sounds like work. What a terrible word, work. But we get in the yoke with the Lord Jesus himself. And he pulls and he guides and thank the Lord for it. We depend on him this morning for that. And I appreciate your prayers for me. In Luke chapter 18, begin our reading in verse 9. The Lord here says, And he, the Lord, spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went, up into the, went into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with, with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as the, this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And the title of the sermon, it's a little long this morning, it comes from verse chapter, uh, chapter 18, verse 9, unto certain which trusted in themselves and despised others. Friend, we're in a dangerous situation. We, learned, uh, we only lean on ourselves. When we believe that we, we have what it takes to get it done, when we think we are to be exalted, when we think we are to be praised, we're in a very precarious situation. The Lord gave, gave this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. And you know what? Often trusting in ourselves leads us to despise other people. It does if we're not careful about it. You know, and we have to be careful as believers. If you've been saved by the blood of the Lamb, would you say amen? amen. If you're certain that God is building a mansion in heaven for you, say amen. amen. If you're convinced you're on your way to heaven, say amen. amen. Well, we're blessed people, aren't we? Amen. Think about this. And when we look at it, we know there are people around this world that can't say amen to that. There are people in this county, in this area of Hampton Roads, that would not say yes to that. And they may say it with some... Some pride, I don't know what the case. And often what we do, because we know we've been forgiven and we know we're on the way to heaven, we think we take God's righteousness as our own. And often what I tend to do is exalt myself because of the gifts God has given me in my eternal salvation. This sermon is for me. This sermon is for anyone who would think like that, anyone that would trust in themselves and despise others. This parable of the Pharisee and this publican, by the way, a publican is a tax collector. Tax collector. Who likes taxes? You always hear people say that we should pay more taxes. And, and occasionally I say, well, you know, no one said you can't. If you want to write a little extra in the check, come April the 15th, go ahead and throw a little extra in there. I don't think the Lord's leading me that way. But if it's God's will for you, I'll be praying for you. Go right ahead. Well, that's another subject altogether. I better be careful. But as even as we look at taxes, a tax collector in this First century society would, would not be a person that would be well loved. In fact, many of them had a very poor, uh, very poor testimony. They were very deceitful. But look here, a, par a Pharisee and a tax collector, uh, th this, this parable teaches us a spirit that should pervade our prayers. It should pervade the way we approach Almighty God, whether, whether we're saved or not. 
This is the first parable here given in Luke chapter 18. I love this. We've spoken about this before, about this persistent widow who kept going back to the judge to get something done. And there's something about importunity in our prayers that God wants to hear. He loves our desperation. When we come to God in desperation, when we, so, so to speak, grab hold of the horns of the altar and we won't let go, as Jacob said, until you bless me. I believe God is honored in all that, and we see that in the first few verses. But here in this second parable, this reminds us that how we, in what manner we ought to pray and how we ought to approach the Lord, the kind of attitude we ought to have. Both of these things should be pondered often by Christians. Listen, the basis of our prayer, the basis of our approach to God is the forgiveness that we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't enter into the throne room of Almighty God on our own merit. It's on the merit of Jesus Christ alone. May we never forget that. We rush into prayer with great expectation for God, so great we forget to ask, we begin to demand. But it's only because of his great mercy and grace that we can address the Lord himself. You know, someone has said the true secret to prayer and the true secret to approaching God is humility. Well, that's not a common commodity, is it? It's not a common commodity. And I would say again, one of, the, one of the terrible byproducts of the blessings of God is that we often lose that humility and we get to be filled with pride. Again, we claim God's righteousness as our own. Pride often gets in the way of us being humble. I can remember my grandfather, this would be my dad's dad. I worked with him for a summer. And occasionally we get in his car, he had a big old car we get in, a big old, uh, big old Oldsmobile. He, he liked to drive a big car. We got in that car to go to work one morning and he just started singing, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. That was his theme song. He said, I, I, each morning I look in the mirror and I get better looking each day. That was his song. He liked to sing that. <laughs> I don't know if that was true, but he liked to sing that song. Yeah, pride gets in the way. Sportscaster and former baseball great Ralph Kiner, you may have heard that name from baseball history. He told a story. He said after a season, he, had, he said, I hit 37 home runs, and I asked the, the Pittsburgh Pirate general manager's name was Branch Rickey. He went in and asked him for a raise, and the manager refused. He said, but, but Branch, I led the league in homers. I reminded him. He said, well, Branch said to him, well, where did we finish in the pennant race this year? And he had to tell him, well, we finished in last place. Well, Branch Ricky said, we can finish in last place without you. You're not getting a raise. <laughs> Sometimes we have to be put in our place a little bit, don't we? <laughs> Dr. Harry Ironside was a great preacher, wonderful use of God. But once he got convicted about his lack of humility... And someone suggested to him a remedy. He said he ought to march through the streets of Chicago wearing a sandwich board sign, shouting the scripture verses on the board for all to hear. Dr. Iron said, that's a great idea. That's a great act of humility. He agreed to this venture, and he went and returned to his study, he removed the board, and he said to himself, I'll bet there's not another man in town who would even do that. Well, there's pride coming in already, isn't it? Winston Churchill once asked, was once asked by someone, doesn't it thrill you to know that every time you make a speech, the hall is packed to overflowing? It's quite flattering, said Mr. Uh, Sir Winston Churchill. He said, but whenever I feel that way, I always remember that if instead of making a political speech, I was going to be hanged here today, the crowd would probably be twice as big. <laughs> we have to be careful. Uh, pride enters in, and God wants us to have a spirit of humility when we approach him. Listen, we have no right to talk to the creator of the universe. We have no right to make any demands on him. We have no right to have any expectation from him. The only right we have to expectation is because of the things he's obligated himself to in his word. And we thank God for it. And may God help us in all of our blessings not to be fooled by them and to enter into a state of pride. Here are two men going to the temple to pray. One's a Pharisee. The other's a tax collector. The Pharisee's prayer is arrogant. It's self-centered this public and this public official, this tax collector, is humble. He's asking for mercy. God receives and exalts the publican, but he, re he rejects the Pharisee. By the way, we, I'll talk about that in a moment, but we use the word Pharisee in a derogatory way, but in this day and age, it wasn't, wouldn't have been viewed that way. Yeah, it was come to mean those things. This parable emphasizes the need for a humble and contrite heart before God. You know, forgiveness comes not to the proud or to the self-righteous. Forgiveness comes to those who recognize their own sinfulness and pray for mercy. That's where we get right with God. And may God help us to understand that. This parable was probably a shock to Jesus' listeners. And he was always saying something in a, in a sense that it was provocative to get their attention. In a sense to turn their world upside down. 
to help them see things the way that God actually sees them. And may God do that in our midst this morning. These folks considered the Pharisees upright and pious. They considered these tax collectors to be wicked sinners. But the Lord said, this is not so when it comes to approaching me. And look here, number one, at the pride of the Pharisee. It's dripping off the page of God's word. It's dripping off the page of God's word. And, and may God help us to keep that from our own lives with his help. You know, Ben Franklin in his autobiography said, there is perhaps no one of our natural passions so hard to subdue as pride. Beat it down, stifle it, mortify it as much as one pleases, and it's still alive. Even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my own humility, he said. Look here, as we get down to verse 10, it says, Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisees were one of the groups of religious leaders in, inside of Judaism, what we would think about Old Testament and since the Old Testament Bible that we think of and the, and the Jews, and that's related to Judaism. The Pharisees were a religious sect in that group. By the way, they weren't the Sadducees. The Sadducees were a liberal sect of Judaism. They did not believe in the resurrection. They were the ones that took most of the seats in the Sanhedrin and the ones that stood before and, and condemned Jesus to death. That's the Sanhedrin. We're not, we're not talking about the Sadducees. We're talking about the Pharisees. Who are they? Who are they? they are, uh, they're much more conservative in their biblical interpretation, much more like middle-class businessmen and merchants involved in the synagogue. They, they had a right, essentially a right view of the Bible, maybe a right view of God, some would think. In the 20th century, if we call someone a Pharisee, it's, it's almost as dirty a word as we can call a Christian, isn't it? Somebody calls you a Pharisee, you get upset, you get offended. But in Jesus' day, it wasn't an insult at all. In fact, to be a Pharisee was to be in the highest rank of religious people. Everything that this man says about himself when he prays is actually true. He's not making it up. He's a blessed man, isn't he? Look at here. He, he gets up and he prays. He says, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this public. And occasionally you and I will look at others and I thank God I'm not like that, Lord. But the reason you and I aren't like that is because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of his forgiveness. Because when Christ came to dwell in us, we became new creatures in Christ. Yeah, that's, that's right. You have to remember that. While he prayed, the people would be standing around watching and they would think, this is, he's such a fine man. Some people probably want to applaud his prayer. Who's the kind of guy you would want to be your next door neighbor? A good citizen, a law-abiding man, a good man, a religious man. If he were to come to church today, we, we'd love him because he would be faithful. He'd be loyal. He'd be here every time the doors would open. And he would give a lot of money in the offering plate. We'd probably make him a deacon, a leader in our church. He was just that kind of guy. He looked great on the outside. He looked great. This is who this man is. We condemn him. But this man is you and me this morning in God's house. We look like the kind of people that God can bless and that God can use. And God is blessing us. And thank God he is using us for his glory. Not our own, but he's just like us. You and I are this man. He thanks God that he's not like other men. He knows how to make his prayer have an external air of humility by thanking God. Imagine that. I thank God that I'm not like you. I thank God that I'm not doing this. He knows how to word that prayer in a, in a very spiritual way. Notice even as he prays here, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. His prayer was not only a prayer to God for God. He thanks God for what he is, not for who God is. He's a self-conscious Pharisee that stands with a heart inflated, talking to himself about himself, all about his excellencies, and he calls it a prayer. Prayer is a conversation with God. By the way, if we're going to have a conversation with God, he already knows all about us, doesn't he? Amen. We might like to change the narrative, but God knows the truth. We might as well come before him humbly and honestly. He says, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. And fasting and tithing were signs of devotion to God and, and still are today. The law only required fasting one day a year, but pious Jews would fast twice in the week on Mondays and Thursdays. Again, the problem was not what he was doing. It was not his accomplishments. The problem was his self-righteous attitude of superiority. And it's amazing to think that when you and I even choose to obey the Lord in the areas, if we're not careful, we'll end up patting ourselves, I'll pat myself on the back. I can pat myself on the back for studying to get ready for a sermon. I can pat myself on the back for trying to witness to someone about the Lord. I can pat myself on the back for standing and teaching a Sunday school class. And I remember this is what God has given me to do. This is his work. Again, I remind you, as I said just a little earlier, we found out we are co-laborers with God. This is not mine. 
We were reminded in the Sunday School Bible study this morning, and I hope you're in there. We're, we're studying a lesson on, on believing belonging to a local church. And I think it's very helpful. We were reminded that we need to get the words my and mine out of our vocabulary just as much as we can. It's all his, isn't it? Even my Christian life belongs to God. My Christian service emanates from God. And may God help me to remember that. We, we forget that sometimes what the Bible says, Proverbs 20 and verse 6, is most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. I think that's true. A faithful man has no business proclaiming his own goodness. We forget the plain testimony of Scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 20. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. There's no perfect person on this earth. And I don't want to upset anybody. There's no perfect people in this room this morning. We're sinners saved by grace, and God help us to, to, to step away from the allurement of becoming a Pharisee about it. Let us see what there is in our own hearts and what the holy law of God re requires, and then we, the, the self-conceit will die. May God help us, uh, like, the, uh, like, like those of the lepers of, of the Old Testament, to think of ourself and, and utter the words, unclean, unclean. Without God's help, we compare ourselves with others. We can always find somebody who's worse than us. Do yourself a favor. Don't compare yourself with others. That's not how God's going to hold us accountable, is it? You know who we ought to be comparing ourselves with? It's not fair. It's impossible. The one we compare ourselves with is the lovely Lord Jesus Christ. The one who left all the glory in heaven. And took on flesh and walked sinlessly on this earth for 33 and a half years. Who willingly died on the old rugged cross. Think about that. Compare yourself with him for just a moment. Stop comparing yourself with the church member across the aisle. By all means, don't compare ourselves with people who don't even know the Lord. Yeah, let's not do that. That's a dangerous thing. It's time to stop trying to impress other people with our piety and spirituality. And start asking God for mercy. We see the pride of the Pharisee here this morning, but I want us to know the, the penitence of the publican or the repentance of the public. He's a tax collector, I remind you. He didn't have very many friends. <laughs> he didn't have very many friends. That's right. I would assume his best friends are probably his co-workers. Yeah, nobody else hung out with a tax collector. They had to have their own little club. The tax collectors were Jews who took up taxes for the Roman rulers. That's one of the things that made them so upset. They were under Roman dominion. And so one of their own, one of the people of their own culture, one of their own people group would come and work for those who had dominion over them and then collect money and give it to those that had dominion over them. And they would do it in such an unrighteous way. They were among the most hated in the Jewish community. They not only were serving the oppressors, they were lining their own pockets by exploiting their, their Jewish neighbors. The Romans would sell leases to individuals for the right to collect taxes. And then they would add these, these folks, the tax collectors would add a surcharge for their own expenses. With no controls, there were abuses in the system like you can imagine. Do you think there are any abuses today in the American tax system? There are a few. Imagine what it would be like under Roman dominion in the first century. Imagine. Tax collectors so hated that if one entered the house, everything in the house was considered unclean. Which would explain the repugnance that people would have when, he would enter, when a man like this would even enter the temple. How about that? I wouldn't let a man like that in my own house, much less in God's house. That's what people were thinking. That's what the Pharisee would think. You know, I repeat myself again, and I have to, I have to be careful. You know what? We ought to have the doors wide open here at Calvary Baptist Church. And it's easy to say that, but it's, it's, it's harder to practice it at times, but the doors would be wide open. Now, if you want to be a member of Calvary Baptist Church, there's a standard to meet. You must know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You must have been baptized, scripturally baptized by immersion. And there are standards to meet. There are standards to meet to continue in your membership of Calvary Baptist Church. We have an active membership role and an inactive membership role. We've had people who have been members of Calvary Baptist Church because they decided not to follow the Lord anymore. We followed the Bible, exercised church discipline, and those people had their membership removed. Not because we didn't like those people, but we believe in the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation doesn't happen without confrontation. It doesn't have without confrontation. There's no fun in it. There's no joy in it except for the fact that we've begun the process of reconciliation. If you want to be a member of Calvary Baptist Church, there are certain standards. We agree and adhere to a body of doctrine. 
But let us always remember the doors are wide open. We're trying to get as many people as we can to come inside this building. And more than that, we're trying to get as many people as we can inside this building to get out there with the truth. If we have an expectation we're going to bring this county here, we better get a much bigger building. Uh, we don't have a building large enough this county to get all of them here. I mean, we can't even have a high school, we don't have a building high, big enough for high school graduation. We can't get all of them in here, to all 40,000 folks in here. We can't do it. If we had service after service after service, we'd have a long time before we got cycled through all that. So we must go to them. And there's no one out there, my friend, the worst sinner among us, who doesn't deserve to hear of God's grace and mercy. Now, again, I would say, and I'm glad you said amen. I don't mean to be so in such a rebuking mood this morning, but it's easy to say amen. How are we actually doing it? When we see the unlovely and we walk on the other side of the street, then we are not a publican. We're not the publican. We're the Pharisee. When we hear, when we hear those and we see those things that, that, that upset us, and rightfully so in some ways, we, don't, we can be upset in the spirit of Jesus Christ. I think the Bible says you can be angry, but you just can sin not. Be angry, but sin not. We ought to be angry against sin, but we ought not hate sinners. And may God help us to have a humility about us. Look, there's this, this, this publican. Look what he does here. He, he's, a, he's hated, but he gets in there and he takes the right approach. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I'm glad that God can hear that prayer and save anyone, aren't you? No matter what we've done, no matter where we've been. God, be merciful. He beat his breasts. He said, have mercy on me, a sinner. This bad man was justified because of what he said and what he prayed and how he prayed. He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He prayed to God. That's the right person. That's the one that can do something about it. He said, be merciful unto me. That's the right request. And he's called himself a sinner, and he made the right confession. And it got God's attention. This phrase, again, refers back to the Old Testament and the Day of Atonement. The high priest would enter the holies of holies and he would sprinkle blood uh, of, the, of a goat on the mercy seat and the golden lid of the Ark of the Covenant. By sprinkling the, sprinkling the blood, the high priest demonstrated that God's way of forgiveness always involves a blood sacrifice. The, ta the tax collector was saying this. He was praying, God, be to me as you are when you look down and see the blood shed on the mercy seat. He was praying, oh God, be merciful to me, not on the basis of what I've done, but on the basis of the blood shed as a substitute. And you and I, if we come to the Lord Jesus, if we come to God, we do it through the blood of Jesus, not on our own merits. Amen. As an unbeliever, we must come through the blood. And even as a believer, we still plead the blood. That's right. We still plead the blood, not our righteous activity. Not our songs for the Lord. Not our lessons for the Lord. Not our service to the Lord. We must come on the merit of Jesus Christ. Without that merit, I have no right to approach an almighty God. Amen. The shocking end of the story is in verse 14. And it says here, I tell you this man, look. This man went down to his house justified. Rather than the other. And you and I have read this story for years. And we say, well, that's exactly the way it ought to be. I want you to know, the people listening to the Lord Jesus Christ were overwhelmed by the fact that a publican received God's forgiveness. They were overwhelmed by the fact that a Pharisee, a man who was conservative religiously, who was rigidly serving God with his life, going over and above what people would even think he would have to do, that he did not receive God's forgiveness. Listen, my friends, we've got this turn. We've got to turn this. We say turn it upside down, but we need to turn it right side up and see what God sees. And may God speak to our heart that way even in this moment. It was a shocking end. This man, this bad man, this sinful man, this scoundrel, this thief, this tax, tax collector went home justified. And this good man, this Pharisee, this moral man, this law-abiding man, he went home still in his sin. Why? Because this man prayed. All he, when he prayed, all he did was boast about his goodness before God. Again, praying to himself about how wonderful he was. Almost as if he would say, God, you're lucky to have a guy like me. And the man who prayed that way went home lost and self-deceived. The worst sinners often make the best candidates for salvation. Let me say that again. The worst sinners often make the best candidates for salvation. It's difficult sometimes for some people, you know, with, with the, with no, if you don't have any bad news, there, news, there, can, be, there can be no good news, excuse me. If you don't have any bad news, there's no good news. You and I must realize that we're, we need God. We need God. The worst sinners make the best candidates. Good people, often it's, it's difficult for them to realize their own sinfulness. 
And may God help us to realize that even as believers, the worst sinners often know they really need the Lord to be saved. They really know they need to be saved. This tax collector knew he didn't have a chance. He didn't really have much of a friend in this world. He needed God. The Pharisee thought he was doing God a favor by showing up and praying. Without a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ, religion will lead you to hell. Religion will lead you to hell, making you think that you're on your way to heaven. It's a shocking truth. But being religious will not, we know that will not gain your way to heaven. I want you to know, again, the righteous deed of coming to church this morning, the righteous deeds of reading your Bible and praying, they do not gain you interest into heaven. It's only by the blood of Jesus. We must admit that we're a sinner. And even after we believe in Christ, we realize we must confess our sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins so that we can keep a wonderful fellowship with our Father. This is a, these are simple truths. You see the pride of the Pharisee. You see the penitence or the repentance of this public. And may God help us to recognize our own, excuse me, our own stinking sinfulness. Amen. I take no joy in trying to say that to you because, my friend, I say this with all sincerity. I agree with Paul. I feel like I could be the chief of sinners. Right. There's so much that goes on in the heart and mind of a man that we need God's forgiveness for. There's so much that goes on that's nowhere near. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, 23, why we ought to guard our heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. It goes on to talk about the eyes and the ears. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Yeah, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see, for the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. That's a children's song, but there's a lot of truth there. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. I mean, careful about guarding those things. I tell you, I can, I've got a suit on today. I've got one of my favorite ties on today. Yeah, one of my favorite ties. You know, and I'm in church. I'm in a, I'm in a Baptist church. I'm in a Baptist church. I mean, that's serious business right there. I mean, I mean, we know that's, God takes note of that, doesn't he? <laughs> but best of my knowledge, I'm doing all the things I know to be right. But I'm not righteous. Only God is. I'm not righteous. Only God is. A preacher once conducted a, a, crusade, a crusade, excuse me, in Bluefield, West Virginia. At the altar call, a well-dressed woman came forward. It was the preacher's custom to have... Uh, person repeat the sinner's prayer with them. So he took the lady's hand and he began to pray the prayer. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I know I need forgiveness for my sinful actions. Please accept me, Jesus. But as he prayed with the woman, she was just silent. She would not repeat those words. He looked at her and asked, well, don't you want to be saved, ma'am? She said, yes, I, I want to be saved, but I'm not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. Well, ma'am, then you can't be saved because Jesus only died for sinners. Amen. But preacher, I'm a good sinner. I'm a good sinner. My friend, there is no place in heaven for good sinners. As long as you and I cling to one shred of our own goodness, we cannot be saved. Amen. You, may have, you, look, you, may have put down, you may have put down the bottle and thank God for it. You ought to. Amen. But don't cling to that as your righteousness is going to heaven. You may have put away that pack of cigarettes, and I think you ought to. Yeah. If you want to please the Lord. You may have decided, and said, I'm not going to listen to that devilish music anymore, and I think that would be a good decision for many of us. Yeah. So I'm not going to watch these movies anymore because they don't help my Christian life. You know, I can get off on a tangent right there, but it, it absolutely surprises me what God's people call entertainment. My friend, we have to be careful. We're, we're not so far along in our Christianity that we can just take all that poison in and, and be, be what God wants us to be. Well, that's another sermon for another day, but I did get one little shot in there. I, you know, I have to be careful. There are things I'm interested in. Look, you and I can't cling to our... We may put aside the movies, the music. We may put aside drugs, alcohol. A man may do something remarkable, decide to be faithful to his wife, and he ought to be may turn it around. It may lay aside that life of unfaithfulness, and I'd be glad to hear about it. But if you think that's, that even that wonderful action cannot buy your eternal salvation. Oh, those things are to be admired. 
I'm glad for that kind of reformation, but God is looking for a transformation. By the way, he's looking for a transformation he can give. As long as we cling to our own goodness, you can't be saved. You're willing to call yourself what you are, a sinner. You could be saved right now. Maybe a good person, a faithful churchgoer, a decent citizen. But God knows our heart, doesn't he? He knows our, the good deeds in us. This world can't pay for all the times we've broken his law. This can't pay for it. We come into God's court on judgment day and present our good works. You know what will happen? We'll be condemned. If that's the evidence we'll have, we'll be condemned. If you come in as an unworthy sinner who's pleaded for the mercy on the basis of Jesus, who shed his blood on Calvary to pay the penalty that you and I deserve, God will declare you justified and say, not guilty. Not guilty. And may God help us to search for that. Seek after that. And to realize that what we do for the Lord comes out of our love for him and the love he's shown for us. Not in order to get something, but because of what God has already done. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer.